Hello, everybody, and welcome back to U University. I'm Dr. Kelly. Well, I've been enjoying the summer this week. On Saturday, I attended my local knitting retreat, which is at Timber Ridge Farm, and that's about 20 miles from my house. That's my friend Anne's farm, and she's the one with the knitting machines. We, we, you might remember we did a video together a few months ago about making sock blanks, so you might remember her from that. Um, anyway, this retreat is just a one-day event, and we do it twice a year, usually in January, and then again in July or August. It's a relatively small group of friends who get together, and sometimes we have five people, and sometimes we have 30. All crafts are welcome. We have people knitting, spinning, weaving, even some needlepoint. Everybody brings a potluck dish, so we always have a fabulous spread at lunch. And the farm is in a beautiful rural setting surrounded by woodlands, and you can hear the birds singing. Sometimes we see deer. Now this time we had around 20 people come, and we could not have asked for more perfect weather. It was warm and sunny, low humidity with a nice little breeze. A lot of us sat outside in the screened in porch area all day. And in the middle of July, it's kind of rare that you get one of those days when you can comfortably sit outside. So we know we were really lucky. Now, while I was at the retreat, I took some video around the farm and the space where we were hanging out. And I started at um, the lane where you come into the property and it's all lined with grapevines. There's some pretty flowers. There's a beautiful trail that goes into the woods and then the barn itself, which is where we meet. And I kind of went around filming the projects that different people were working on. And I compiled these clips into a little video montage for you. So here it is. So that was a little slice of my day on Saturday. A lovely setting and wonderful friends. We'll be doing it again at the end of January, so if you're in the area, you are welcome to join us. Let me know if you want more information about the Timber Ridge Retreat. Okay, well I have kind of a set of finished objects to share with you today. And this is a set of felted bowls that I finished this week. I don't know why, but I always seem to get in the mood for felting right in the middle of the hot summer. It seems like felting might be more appropriate for a winter project. Apparently not for me though. I had some bulky yarn that I wanted to use up and this set of bowls was perfect because you really can just use some leftover yarn that you might have. Of course, the yarn needs to be 100% wool and not superwash. 
And for felting, I tend to gravitate toward bulky weight yarn or worsted weight yarn held double because it goes really fast and you can knit really tightly so that it's easier to felt. Now the pattern for this set of bowls is called Felted Nesting Bowls by Tricia Knitberg. It is a free pattern you can get on Ravelry and each bowl is basically, well you start at the bottom with one color, do the increases and then you switch to a second color and do the side and then you go back to the first color and do the top and then bind off. So this variegated yarn is Malabrigo Rasta and it's in the Boreal colorway and that is bulky weight. Um, this was a skein of yarn that I won as a, at a, as a prize at Stitches Midwest one year. It's gorgeous yarn but I only had one skein of it and I don't really knit a lot with bulky weight yarn so I was looking for a project to use this up. Now the green is Minnehaha Fiberworks Peruvian Highland Wool and the color is Queen Anne's Lace. This is an Aran weight yarn that I held double. And then the lavender that you see on these other two bowls is Imperial Yarn Native Twist in the Tufted Primrose colorway. And this is 100% wool, bulky weight, soft spun single. And because it's loosely spun, it is a little more fragile than you might expect and it did break on me once while I was knitting the bowls but since I was felting them anyway, it wasn't that big of a deal. Now I knit the bowls really in just a few hours. Um, here's what they looked like after I finished knitting them, but before they were felted. And here's what they look like now. I'm really happy with the way they turned out. I did the felting in the washing machine and it took less than 30 minutes to felt the yarn. Now I have to say that the Malabrigo Rasta felted very quickly. Um, it is noticeably thicker than the other yarns. I mean it is really dense and solid. Now you'll notice that these are supposed to be nesting bowls and the smaller two do actually nest but the larger one does not and that's because I goofed up on the stitch count and I didn't realize it. Um, the, the big one was the first bowl that I made and it ended up being smaller in diameter than it should be. So it should be a wider diameter than this middle size bowl, but it's fine. I'll still use them for storing little things. So yeah, these felted bowls graduated off my needles this week. I'm gonna quickly mention another project that graduated this week, even though it's not knitting because it does involve yarn. And that is a cute little yarn basket that I made. You might remember a few months ago I did a video about how to make these yarn baskets and I'll link that video below in case you missed it. Um, again this was the Malabrigo Rasta yarn that I used for the felted bowl that I just talked about and I used up all the yarn between the felted bowls and this little basket. These yarn baskets are great projects for bulky weight yarn because with that thicker yarn they go really fast. And I think it turned out so pretty with the purple color. There's another project that graduated this week. I wanted to do a video about pom-poms, tassels, and fringe for a while now because these types of embe embellishments seem to be really popular right now. So I thought let's start with a little bit of history because I'm always curious as to you know, the background on the things I'm talking about. And I was curious where all these embellishments came from. How did people start wearing them on their clothing and decorating their homes with them? Well, pom-poms, tassels, and fringe fall within the textile category of passementry, which is the production of different kinds of trims. Now, as opposed to techniques like embroidery or beading, it is made separately and then applied to the item afterward. It's usually made of things like cords, threads, braids, ribbon, beads, tassels, and they're all arranged in repeating patterns. Although it is associated with lining the edges of garments and other textiles, passementry can really be anywhere. 
Now, passementry can be traced back to the nomadic tribes of the Middle East. What we know today as embellishments or ornaments really had functional beginnings. Cords were made to help construct tents, and woven bands were used to tie provisions onto camels and donkeys during travel. And eventually, some of these utilitarian materials developed into decorations. For example, tassels appear in many cultures in various designs. They were originally knots designed to keep cords from unraveling. One of the earliest functional applications of tassels was to finish the warp ends of woven textiles like rugs. And by the Middle Ages, tassels decorated bed canopies, pillows, and even carriages. As another example, the application of braiding was originally used to hide and reinforce seams in garments. Now, you have to know that early fabrics were woven on very narrow looms, and then the pieces were sewn together. So the embellishments like braiding were a decorative way to cover up all the seams and reinforce them. The French mastered the art of passementerie and soon dominated the European market. Initially, these beautiful and elaborate ornamentations were reserved for only the nobility, the high-ranking military officers, and important religious officials. There was even an act of parliament passed to restrict the wearing of ribbons to only nobility. Imported materials like silk and gold thread were used to handcraft exquisite decorations for the clothing and home furnishings of the rich. In the 16th century, a guild of passementeers was created, which required a, an apprenticeship of seven years to become a master. Within the next hundred years, interior design was becoming increasingly more extravagant. It reached its peak in the 18th century when the aristocracy had an insatiable appetite for covering every square inch of their living space with ornate wall and ceiling moldings, silk upholstery, tapestries, and fine furniture embellished with fancy tassels and trims. All of this ornamentation signified the status of the owner of the house or the wearer of the clothing. But over time, once the decorations could be made easily and inexpensively in factories, elaborate ornamentation became available to everyone. Now let's turn to specific embellishments that I want to discuss today. So first up is the pom-pom. In the 18th century, the fierce Hungarian cavalry wore a tall structured cap called the shako. And the use of this type of hat expanded across Europe where different regiments put their own twist on it. Some decorated the caps with metal plating and others topped them with feathered plumage or pom-poms. The color and the shape of the decorations signified a soldier's unit and rank. Meanwhile, off the battlefield, the pom-pom held great significance as well. In South America, for example, traditional garments of both men and women were decorated with different pom-poms as a sign of their marital status. Married men wear hats with mostly red pom-poms. Those who are engaged wear an embroidered bag decorated with brightly colored pom-poms. And single men wear white hats with different colored pom-poms. As far as the ladies, they wear embroidered black shawls with pom-poms attached. Now, single women sew large pom-poms onto their shawls, and one small pom-pom means the woman is married. Now, Catholic priests wear square caps called berettas, often topped by a pom-pom. The hats come in different colors, and so do the pom-poms. The color of the hat and pom-pom signifies the wearer's status. So, for example, cardinals wear red, bishops wear violet, and priests wear black. In Scotland, men wear a floppy beret called a Balmoral bonnet, and that is topped with a bright red pom-pom. 
So if you look around, you will see that pom-poms can be found on traditional dress in all regions of the world. People also take great pride in dressing their animals during ceremonies, and many of the adornments on the animals include pom-poms. So it seems that the pom-pom is truly pervasive across the globe and has been for quite some time. Now let's talk a little bit about how to make pom-poms. There are several different types of pom-pom makers available to purchase. And of course, you can always just use a piece of cardboard to do the same thing as I'm going to show you. The clover pom-pom makers are my favorites because they are super easy to use and make the best, thickest, fluffiest pom-poms in my experience. I'll spend a few minutes showing you how to use them. Now I have seven different sizes of pom-pom makers uh, ranging from the largest one of four and a half inches down to the smallest one, which is three quarters of an inch. Now these do not come as a complete set, but they come in packages of one or two. So these two came, these two little ones came together. Um, these two medium sized ones came together. These two came together and this largest one came by itself. And you can pick up these pom-pom makers for well under $10 per, per package from places like Amazon, Joann's, Michael's, Hobby Lobby, and, and craft stores like that. As you can see, they make quite a range of sizes of pom-poms from the jumbo size to the miniature size. Now to make a pom-pom, you'll need one of the pom-pom makers, or you can use a piece of cardboard, some waxed cotton or linen cord, and a sharp scissors. These clover pom-pom makers are super easy to use, and as I said, they result in a really nice thick pom-pom. You'll notice that the pom-pom maker consists of two sides. Each side has a pair of arches that you open up and wind the yarn around. So the first thing you do is open up one side of the pom-pom maker. Be sure to push up both sides of the arch and align them in the fully open position. While you're holding on to both arches, wind the yarn evenly around them. Keep winding the yarn until it completely fills up that side of the arches. With thicker yarn, the winding will go faster Thinner yarn will require more winding. For this demonstration, I'm using some worsted weight yarn. So just keep going until the yarn is again filling up that arch. When you're done, you won't be able to see the arch at all. The yarn will look like it goes straight across. At this point, close that set of arches with the yarn on it. Then open the other set of arches on the other side of the pom-pom maker and make sure that they're lined up. Start winding the yarn around these arches, doing the same thing you just did on the other side. Once these arches are full of yarn, close them, and now you have yarn wound around both sides of the pom-pom maker. Next, you're gonna cut the yarn between the two arches on both sides. You'll need a pair of sharp scissors for this, and you'll only be able to cut a little bit of the yarn at a time. You definitely won't be able to just slide right through the whole thing all at once. So just take the tip of your scissors and cut a few strands at a time. Make sure that the arches stay closed while you're cutting. Once the yarn is cut on that side, turn the pom-pom maker around and do the same thing on the other side. Now you're going to tie the pom-pom so that it stays together in the middle. Now the best way to do this is to use a waxed cotton cord or a waxed linen cord. My favorite is the waxed linen cord because I feel like it's a little stickier and the knot won't come undone. You can get both cotton and linen waxed cord at Joann's, Michael's, Hobby Lobby, all the craft stores, and probably online as well. So you're gonna cut off a length of waxed cord, enough to go around the circumference of the pom-pom with some extra length to spare. Here I'm using waxed linen cord. And you take that cord and place it in between the arches so it goes around the middle of the pom-pom. Tie it firmly and make a double knot. 
The wax finish on this cord makes the knot stick so it stays tight. Okay, now to release the pom-pom you just made, open up both sides of the arches. Lift each of the four arches slowly and then separate the two sides of the pom-pom maker. Now you can remove the pom-pom and just shake it out to fluff it up. You'll inevitably need to use your scissors to shape the pom-pom into a nice round shape. Once you do that, you're ready to attach it to your hat or make whatever you want out of it. So what else can you do with pom-poms? Well, it seems like the most popular application of pom-poms is to put one on top of a hat. But have you seen the, the knit hats with two pom-poms? They are pretty cute. And you can even embellish other kinds of hats besides knit hats, like this straw hat. And there are other things you can do with pom-poms. You can make a whole rug out of pom-poms. Wouldn't that be so nice and soft and squishy? You can use pom-poms to trim a pillowcase or a blanket or curtains or a dress. Basically anything you can put an edging on, you can use pom-poms for that edging. You can also make a pom-pom garland, maybe even to decorate your Christmas tree. You can make a pom-pom wreath for Christmas or really any season. Another popular item right now is pom-pom keychains, which would be super easy to make. And something I did when I was a kid, you can put pom-poms on your ice skates or roller skates. It just adds to the fun. Lastly, I wanted to just mention the adorable little pom-pom projects you can make from books like this one, Adventures in Pom-Pom Land by Miko Diane Bocek. I love this book because she tells you how to make pom-poms with a simple piece of cardboard. So if you don't have pom-pom makers like the ones I just showed you, you can definitely get the same thing using cardboard. She also takes you step by step how to put the pom-poms together to make little critters, how to do the eyes and the facial features, how to make arms and legs, and so forth. You can get this book on Amazon for around $18. If you like making little projects like this, you would definitely adore this book. So again, that is Adventures in Pom-Pom Land by Miko Diane Bocek. Now let's talk a little bit about tassels. Like I said previously, the tassel originated as a weaving knot used to tie off various garments and other textiles to prevent unraveling. Now all a tassel is, is thread wound around a suspended cord. King Tut was found wearing a necklace with tassels. The Chinese were known to incorporate tassels into their intricate silks. In the Middle East, tassels were used as protection from evil spirits and to drive away demons. Currently, prayer beads from that part of the world are commonly embellished with tassels. And tassels have been used by various armies to distinguish rank on a uniform. So kind of like pom-poms, the tassel can be found in cultures and native costumes around the world. Now tassels were very popular until the early 20th century, which kind of shunned the opulence of Victorian era aesthetic. Simple and unadorned became fashionable and the use of tassels declined. However, they regained popularity during the 1920s after Oxford and Cambridge University started affixing tassels to their graduation caps to signify intellectual superiority. The rest of the world followed suit, and now you can find tassels all over the place, hanging off purses, jackets, and slippers, and more. Okay, so now I'm going to show you real quickly how to make a tassel. And again, you can use plain old cardboard for this, and there are a number of different types of tassel makers that you can buy, but I really like these clover tassel frames. I have two of them, one in the larger size and one in the smaller size. The large one makes tassels between two and three eighths inches long and four inches long. The small one makes tassels from one and three sixteenths inches to two inches long. And here you can see the range of tassel sizes you can make with these. And you can get these tassel frames 
on Amazon for under $10 each. To make a tassel, you will need a tassel frame, or you can use a piece of cardboard, some waxed cotton or linen cord, and a sharp scissors. You're first going to set the size of the tassel you want to make on the tassel frame. The smaller tassel frame does three sizes of tassels, and the larger tassel frame can do five different sizes. To set the size, you loosen the screws on each side using the small white knobs. Then just line up the small marks on the side of the tassel maker. Once those are lined up to the size you want, twist the white knobs clockwise to tighten them. The first thing you do to start the tassel is place the tassel maker face down. That is, the side with the white knobs should be face down. Insert the yarn into the gap at the lower left and then start winding the yarn up and over the top center of the tassel frame, then down around the bottom center. Keep winding the yarn around as many times as you want. The more times you wind the yarn, the thicker your tassel will be. For the largest tassels that I made, I wound the yarn around 20 to 25 times. For the smallest tassel, I wound it about eight times. And once you've finished winding the yarn, insert the yarn into the gap on the opposite side of the frame and cut it. If you want to include a loop for hanging your tassel, now is the time to do that. All you do is take a length of yarn and tie the ends together. The longer the yarn, the bigger the loop. I used a length of yarn of about five to six inches on the tassels I made. Okay, so you've got your loop of yarn for the top of the tassel. Insert that knot into the center of the wrapped yarn and push it inside all of the yarn so you can't see it. Be sure the knot is below the horizontal center of the frame. You can find the horizontal center by looking at the triangle markers that line up on either side of the frame. Next, you're going to tie the middle of the tassel. For this, I like to use the same waxed cotton or linen cord that I talked about for making pom-poms. And here I'm using the waxed linen cord. Line up the cord with the horizontal center marks, the little triangles. Wrap the cord around the tassel yarn and firmly tie two knots so they don't come undone. Then cut the excess cord off. Holding the center of the yarn where you just tied off, insert the tip of your scissors into the top groove and cut through the yarn. Do the same thing on the bottom of the frame. Now take a hold of the loop and shake the tassel so that the upper threads of the bundle come down and hang evenly. The threads should spread radially from the center. Smooth out the yarn and spread out the threads so that the tassel looks even. Now it's time to make the head of the tassel. Once all the yarn is smoothed out, take a separate length of yarn and start wrapping it tightly around the top of the tassel. On the ones I made, I wrapped it around maybe five to 10 times, depending on the size of the tassel. Then you're just going to tie both ends of the yarn together. Finally, cut the tips of the yarn so that the ends all line up straight. You can do this by holding your, the ends between your fingers and snipping the yarn ends off. And now you have a tassel. So what can you do with tassels? Well, a lot of things, of course. You can use tassels as trim on things like blankets, dresses, shawls, and rugs. You can make tassel earrings. You can make tassel garland, just like the pom-pom garland. You can use a tassel as a cute zipper pull. Tassels make really adorable trim for your handbags, and I've seen some pretty pillows that are embellished with tassels. There are really endless ways you can incorporate tassels into your crafting. And if you're looking for a resource uh, for, full of inspiration about making tassels, I can recommend this book. The Art of Tassel Making by Susan Dickens. It has specific instructions for making tons of fancy tassels. 
One of my favorite parts of this book is the section on the elements of a basic tassel. In this entire section, the pages are cut into thirds so you can mix and match different styles of tassel cords, heads, and skirts. It's really fun to play with. So if designing elegant tassels is something that appeals to you, I think you would love this book. And again, that is The Art of Tassel Making by Susan Dickens. Okay, the last form of embellishment I'm gonna talk about today is fringe. Fringe trim has been around for about 5,000 years. While we don't have any physical evidence of the fringe itself, we do have detailed sculptures and written accounts from ancient Mesopotamia that give us a picture of what this embellishment was like. Fringe was mainly used in skirts and shawls. It came in a variety of styles, hanging straight, knotted, or tied into unique designs. Fringe was dyed in all colors and was sometimes layered in tiers covering the entire garment. Fringe was so important in Mesopotamian culture that it was used as a kind of signature for important contracts. Rather than signing their name or using a seal, men would press their fringe into a clay contract. Native Americans were also some of the first people to incorporate fringe into their clothing. They usually used leather or suede, which would sometimes be decorated with beads or dyes. And the fringe was not only decorative, but it was also practical. For example, fringe repels rainwater by channeling the water drops down the fringe and away from the body. The 1920s era is often called the golden age of fringe. Women's dresses were loose and finished off with a fringe trim. One dress in particular, called the Charleston, was completely covered in fringe. It was a popular party dress because when the person wearing it danced, the fringe would move and shake along with the wearer. Fringe fell out of fashion for a few years, but it returned in the 1950s with a rebellious edge. Leather biker jackets featured fringe detailing. Around the same time, Elvis Presley's fringe jackets became part of his signature look. Fringe was also a fashionable trim for movie stars. In the 1960s and 70s, many designers were inspired by original Native American and African fringe. Yves Saint Laurent created an African collection in 1967 and many celebrities wore fringe jackets and dresses. Fringe became an especially iconic look for Cher, who incorporated it into her wardrobe. Over the years, she has worn outrageous fringed outfits in her performances. Today, fringe has been seen on the fashion runways in a number of designers' collections, and it's definitely seen in the knitting, crocheting, and weaving world as a common trim on scarves, shawls, and blankets. Now, putting fringe on a knit or crochet item is super easy, and adding it can really perk up your finished object. Here I have a scarf that I knit a few years ago, and as you can see, I mean, it's, it's a nice cabled scarf, but the edges are pretty plain. Let's see what happens when we add a little bit of fringe to it. For making fringe, you need a ruler, a sharp scissors, and a crochet hook. First, you're gonna want to cut the yarn into pieces that are twice as long as the fringe you want to end up with. So let's say I want a three inch fringe. That means I'm gonna cut the yarn into six inch segments. You need to have the fringe cut before you attach it to your garment. And if you need more to finish the fringe, you can always cut more later. Once you have the yarn cut, you're gonna start attaching it to the item in small bundles. So for example, I'm gonna pick up five strands of yarn and holding them together, fold them in half. This forms a loop at one end and the fringe at the other end. You're gonna attach the loop end to your item, your, your scarf, and to do this, you simply insert the crochet hook along the edge of the item. 
put it all the way through the knitting so it comes out the other side, and then catch the loop of yarn you're holding and pull that loop back through the knitted item. Be careful that you only pull the loop through a little ways. You don't want to pull all the strands of yarn completely through. So now your cut yarn is hanging out halfway through the edge of your knit item. What you're going to do is take the fringe end of that cut yarn and pull it through the loop end. Pull it firmly so that the loop rests snugly against the edge of your item and holds that fringe in place. Keep repeating this process until you have finished the fringe along the edge of the scarf. You can space the bundles of fringe yarn as close together as you want or as far apart as you want. And that's your completed look. Fringe is an easy way to put a fun finish on your knitted items. If you're looking for ideas for how to make different kinds of fringe, I recommend this book, Knitting on the Edge by Nikki Epstein. This book is about various types of edging like ruffles and lace and, and picots, but there's an entire chapter about fringe. And she tells you how to do some fancy fringe edgings, including some gorgeous beaded ones. So yeah, pick up Knitting on the Edge by Nikki Epstein for some great ideas for fringe and other edgings on your knit items. So that is a brief overview of pom-poms, tassels, and fringe. In hindsight, I probably could have done an entire show about pom-poms, an entire other show about tassels, and yet another one about fringe. So if there's anything about these embellishments that I didn't cover that you're interested in seeing or that you have a question about, please let me know in the comment section below and maybe I'll do a follow-up video and address those questions or issues if you have an interest in that. Well, that brings us to the end of today's show. I hope you've enjoyed hearing a little bit about the history of passementry and also seeing how you can easily make your own pom-poms, tassels, and fringe to add to your knitted or crocheted items. So what are your experiences with making these types of embellishments? Have you used them before? Do you have any tips for us that I didn't cover today? And of course, I'm always interested in hearing about what was new to you or if you learned anything. Please share your thoughts and reactions in the comment section below. I always enjoy hearing from you. And as always, please feel free to comment if you have any questions about today's show or if you have an idea for what you'd like to see on future episodes or if you'd like to see a product tested. Leave your suggestions in the comment section below. I would love to hear your ideas. And lastly, you can find links to everything I've talked about today in the description box below. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today, and I'll see you in the next video. I'm thinking about discussing lighting in next week's video. I've gotten quite a few questions about what kinds of lights I use for crafting and what's the best kind of lighting. So I'm going to talk about the lights that I have as well as review the research on lighting and how it affects our eyes, our ability to see well, and our comfort. So I hope you'll join me for that next time. And in the meantime, stay smart and have a sparkly week.